This podcast is part of the Big Heads Media Podcast Network. Go to BigHeadsMedia.com for more great podcasts. And now, on with the show. Hey everyone, welcome to... We're watching here! We're watching here! This is Opinionated Movie Talk with Chris and Perry. My name is Chris Williams. With me, I mean, this is an easy one. He is the McCabe to my Mrs. Miller, Perry Seibert. <laughs> I can't decide, yeah, which of those characters' fates I'd rather have. At yeah. The end of the movie. <laughs> it's a wash. Yeah, you go out, you, yeah, you, you get to go out guns blazing. I get to go out, you know, in an opium <laughs> haze. So it's all, you know, it, it, it all washes out in the end. So... Perry, how are you doing? Happy New Year and Merry Christmas. And Happy New Year. Merry Christmas. Uh, welcome to 2022. And yes. uh, all is all is well in my universe. How are you, Chris? We are doing well. Uh, you know, it's a busy. We were talking about this offline. It's been a busy start to the year, um, you know, but uh, it's good. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It was a good holiday season, a good restful break that we had. And then, uh, you know, we just got thrown into the thick of it. But um we have a really busy show today. There's a lot we're going to talk about, uh, including our follow-up to MASH, our second entry in the Robert Altman series we're doing. We're going to be talking about McCabe and Mrs. Miller in just a little bit. But before that, we have a few things on deck, and we'll start like we always do. Um, Perry, what have you been watching? So, because, you know, it takes me a little longer to get around to the TV that everybody's talking about, uh, my wife and I uh, did Squid Game. Mm. We watched we watched Squid Game because my wife my wife likes a good dystopian, uh, violent, futuristic vision. Uh, And so uh, it was one of those cases where it's 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 finally made. I have no complaints. I don't think it's bad. But about the fifth episode, I was like, well, I don't understand what story they're telling anymore. I don't understand what I'm watching anymore. And so it was all going to depend on uh, that ending was how I was going to end up responding to this. And uh, no, that ending is <laughs> that ending is just nothing. Okay. I, I, I want a story. I don't want another season. I don't, I don't know. That's how TV. This, I don't know how this works. This isn't, this isn't interesting. This isn't a story. This is an exercise. Uh, and it, it's, it is, like I said, incredibly well-made. The the sequences of the games are really well directed, are brilliantly directed. They are they are very tense. They are they are. I can understand why people were drawn to this, uh, but boy, if you tell me it's about something, it's all what you think it's about. It's not what it's really about. <laughs> I I have not seen Squid Game. It, it's one of those shows that's. I, I feel like I need to watch it out of obligation, but I. I, I I kind of am tired of, well, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to offset that in a minute. I, I'm kind of tired <laughs> of dark for the sake of dark TV, but I also just started watching yellow jackets, which I really like. Um, <laughs> but I just, I haven't gotten around to squid game mainly because the only thing people could say to convince me that it was good was that it was very bloody. And that wasn't my thing. You know, you know what? It's all that awful digital blood spray oh god it doesn't look right it doesn't look real it all looks i hate that like a video game yeah uh not yeah. in a good way i might get around to that later i you know I, I feel like when i sit and watch tv i have about enough time for like a half hour show so like mcgruber on peacock has been <laughs> which it, i need to get to uh don't rush. Don't I rush. love MacGruber. I do love, I, I MacGruber. love MacGruber. That's why I need um, to get to it. 10 episodes of MacGruber goes a long way. <laughs> <laughs> 90 uh, minutes of MacGruber went just long enough for yes, me with the movie. Yes, so, yes, yes, I can see that makes sense. Um, and, you know, Cobra Kai, I'm, I'm into that, but I don't know. So, I, your, your half endorsement makes me kind of think maybe. No, I it's not an endorsement. I'm saying it's fine. I get why yeah. people are drawn to it, but I don't think it's. I don't think it's terribly interesting unless it's of, unless it's of interest. <laughs> you yeah. know, it's, it's just, it's, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, that's a bummer, but it also gets, gets a uh, 10 hour TV show off my lap. So I don't have to watch. Exactly. It. There you go. So I, I feel good about that. How about you, Chris? What have you been watching? Uh, other than Yellow Jackets. Yeah. Other than Yellow Jackets, which I've really only watched like the first two episodes of so far, but I like it. Um, Man, I've I've gone to see a few things. I saw Scream. I kind of liked that. I saw um, 
American Underdog, which is a movie, and uh, my, my, <laughs> my son enjoyed it much more than I did, and he is the he is the audience for that. Uh, but the movie that I've been really taken with, I saw Fran Kranz's uh, Mass recently. Did did oh, you see yep. that? I have not. I've heard nothing. Okay, things. I'd like to. I just this haven't. this was a movie. Um, our our uh, colleague Tom Santilli was talking this one up. Uh, he was very high on this one, and I was interested because the subject matter. Um, seemed intriguing, even if it seemed very heavy. It's basically two families who have lost children in a school shooting. Um, one of the kids was a victim of the shooter. The other, the other kid was the shooter. And uh, about a year or so after, the parents um, just meet in a church building to talk. And that's really all it is. Is it's these two couples sitting in a in a basement talking and trying to see if there's any chance for not even so much forgiveness or restitution. It's just, how do you heal? How do you move on? And it's basically two couples talking about two worst nightmares. I would imagine any parent has, Um, you know, you you don't want your kid to become the victim of violence. You don't want your kid to become the perpetrator for violence. Mm -hmm. Um, And so these are very heavy conversations um, but what I really appreciated is it's not even so much about that subject. It, it's about how do we form, how do we form just kind of a place to facilitate these type of discussions or how do we structure this in our own lives so we can start to talk through our feelings and our understandings. And it, it's really a collection of monologues, but, and, and it can feel kind of talky and kind of, you know, everything's, everyone's been given their big moment. But you realize like when they're having these moments, they're trying to convince themselves or understand what they're feeling. And Mm -hmm. it's really great acting by um, uh, Martha Plimpton, Reed Burney, uh, Jason Isaacs and Ann Dowd. All four are fantastic. Um, As someone who is involved in church, I appreciated the way it sets up churches as a as a place to have these conversations without letting that be too intrusive. It, it, you know, Mm -hmm. it's kind of about. There's a lot of attention played to how do you set up this room? How do you make it ready for these conversations? And then after that, like the, the people at the church back off and it's just about these families. And it, it's just, it's an acting masterclass. It, it's really well directed. I think this is Fran Kranz's first film. Um, I know him best, you know, from his work with Joss Whedon, uh, Cabin in the Woods and, and things like that. But uh, yeah, I highly recommend this. It, it's extremely well acted. I, I, it's going to be very high on my top 10 list. The idea of emotional sanctuary is very interesting. Yes. And I it, have a feeling that's what's going on here. Yeah. It, it, it's really fantastic. Um, yeah. It, I, I recommend that it's available to rent. I, it was released in like a handful of theaters in the fall, but uh, it, it's really good. It's the kind of thing I'm very prone to liking. So I am. Yes. I, I, I think I, you might dig I'd it. Like to see it. Yeah. 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 I like, I liked it a lot. Um, so yeah, you can rent that anywhere. Um, before we get into our Robert Altman feature, we had a couple other subjects I wanted to bring up. Um, Perry, you know that every few years I like to bring up like a New Year's resolution for movies. I do. Um, and it's very dangerous when I do that, I learned, because the last the last movie resolution I made was to see as many films in as many different theatrical formats as possible. Yes. And then a month later, every single theater in the down. world got yeah. shut down. Exactly. Um, yes. So, I, you know, I was a little worried about making another one, but I decided, you know, I want to better myself. I want to improve my movie going experiences. So I made a resolution and I want to toss it by you to see what your uh, what your process is on this or, or if you do any of this. And I have chosen to spend the year not watching movie trailers. <laughs> um I, I, there's a lot of critics online who I respect who they they live what's called the unsullied life uh, and they choose to just go into a movie cold and not have seen any of the marketing, any of the promotional materials, any of the trailers so that they're surprised. I love trailers. It, it, it's a lot of fun for me to watch a trailer for a new movie. I think my marketing side really kind of digs that. But I was like, you know, the few times I've gone into a movie completely cold it's been a special experience. So I'm like, what if I tried that with everything, even the big stuff? And um, 
it, it's been tough because I've gone to the movies and basically have had to go out in the lobby and like play my uh, play with my phone until I can hear Nicole Kidman talking about like heartbreak feeling good in a place like this and then know <laughs> oh it's time to walk back in um, or like look down at my phone because my son's sitting next to me um, but uh, it, it's been interesting I, I'm, I'm curious to see how it plays out we haven't really gotten to the phase where any movies this year that I would have had a chance to skip trailers for have come out, but I'm, I'm curious to see how it goes. Are you a trailer guy? Uh, I am, but with the qualification that I generally don't look them up. I love trailers at the movies. Mm-hmm. Honestly, you know, when I had my great first back at the movies experience, when I was back physically in the movies, it was that it was at a regular screening. It was the critic screening and it was, Oh, seeing previews back in the middle of summer for, <laughs> parallel mothers and licorice pizza <laughs> it was like and i would never want to deny myself uh, that pleasure no i think trailers are actually a very they are an integral part of the movie going process for me i i like trailers a great deal but yes i agree you shouldn't be spending all your time online looking at them on youtube and yeah. obsessing over them i think you should come across them I think it's, I, I, I can't help it. That's, I wouldn't, I would never do that. What you're doing. I would, I would never want to deprive that of my, maybe I'd do it for Lent, but I wouldn't do it for, I wouldn't do it as a, <laughs> as a resolution to, to, to rechange the way I'm living my life. I would do it as a form of penance, but no, I, I, and, and I understand it. And I agree when you have that moment. I mean, it's a great thing about, you know, getting to be part of a film festival is walking into something and knowing, almost nothing about it other than the mm-hmm. director and knowing the leads and thinking, well, I like all their work. Let's see what this is. Yes. There is great pleasure to be having that. I'm not saying your reasons are perfectly sound and I admire them greatly. And I agree. That is, that is always a pleasure. And it's very hard to do when you spend as much time watching and reading and thinking about movies as we do. Uh, but that said, you know, the anticipation of a great trailer is is fantastic, and it is fun to see you know the wild swings of something like, you know, if you go back and look at the trailer for Science of the Lambs, it's one of the most pedestrian things you'll ever see. Like it doesn't, hmm. you have no idea what that film's going to be, and then you know you watch the rewatch the original trailer for La La Land, and you realize that's so much better than the movie, <laughs> so much better than the movie that got made. Well, and there's some movies where I, I like, I feel like a good movie trail, you know, uh, even a trailer that gives a lot of weight can't ruin a good movie. Right. Agreed. Like, Agreed. Like it, it, and there are some movies like I think back to, you know, I, I'm thinking mainly of like the big movies here, like Spider-Man's and stuff like that, where they all seem built towards making the trailer. And, and I think that's what's in my mind, too, is like yeah. those big movies, especially. Wow. I wish I didn't know half of the stuff in the movie. Like. Um, But I was also thinking of things like, so right now for my newsletter, I'm doing a retrospective on the before series. So I've been going back and watching those, which as we've talked about before, that is a delight. Um, But I remember seeing before midnight and thinking, wow, I wish the trailer had given nothing away on this one. I I wish I didn't know where Jesse and Celine were at the beginning of this movie uh, and the trailer just kind of put it out there which you know in marketing you kind of have to do so i I have a hunch this is going to be a year-long experiment um but i I think i I think in the end i'll probably find some middle ground where i won't you know i won't be sitting at youtube looking for trailers but i I think you're right too that in the in the theater it's a big thing it it, it is part of the experience Um, but i'm curious to see what it is to go a year without that experience and see I'm, how that changes everything. And I'm looking forward to progress reports. But yeah. I, mean, I think what I I'm going to do throughout the year. Oh, that's how that's going for you. I think what I'm also going to do is I'm going to start writing about, you know, looking back on the marketing for a movie after it comes out to be like, Oh, how did they sell that? Like, you know, just go, that might be fun. I don't know if I'll do that, but we'll, we'll see. <laughs> we'll idea. see. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's, that's my new year's resolution. Um, And then the other thing I want to talk about was I caught up with a movie you had talked very highly about on our last episode, one of our last episodes. Um, You said, don't look up. You you said it would definitely be one of your favorite films, not of the year, of the decade. It is. I will stand by it. Have you seen it two more times since? Yes. Okay. (laughs) So I saw um, Day After Christmas. I fired up my Netflix and I watched Don't Look Up. I liked it a lot. I, it is. I, I don't know if I would put it on my top 
of the decade list yet. You know, sure, sure. No, I'm, I'm not a saying way everyone to go. should have that reaction. Let's be clear. I was being very, yeah. very personal and honest with that reaction. But I am putting together right now a very belated list of my top 10 movies of the year. And I can't fathom that Don't Look Up won't be somewhere on that list. I really enjoyed it. I We've talked about this before. I have a history of really liking what Adam McKay does. Um, and, and I thought it was very funny. I thought it was very smart. I thought it was very angry, um, yeah. but very help, heartfelt at the end, too. I am just kind of shocked, and I wanted to talk about it because I don't know if I get it. There, it, Are we in the minority on this? It's like a... Yes. Uh, it, it, I'm it's pretty got, sure we are. It, it's got a 55% on Rotten Tomatoes. Um, David Chen, who is a critic, I really respect. He does the uh, the film cast. Um, and he said it is the film he hated watching most this year. Um, and, and he thought it was extremely smug, which is a comment I hear leveled at that at all. Or I hear leveled at that quite a bit, um, which I don't quite by because there's real emotion to it um but i want to toss that out there i want to i want to talk about this and I, I i don't know just just toss that out there and to have you hear, hear you defend it and i can defend it and so i personally i think that a lot of the negative reaction to it um has to do with the fact that it's just a straight on shot at all media like it doesn't mm-hmm. it, it it is it is absolutely indicting the state of the modern media, both social and old, the, no one leaves this unscathed. You know, newspapers are attacked just as just as openly as social media, just as openly as influencers and every other obnoxious phrase from the last two years you can think of. So I think that's what's driving a lot of the hate, as I think people feel attacked. And they should. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> that's, I can see that. That's the point. Let me say, you know, I, I, I was only saying slightly sarcastically good when you talk about the critic you like feeling attacked by it. I'm like, well, yeah, <laughs> he's attacking you. That's why. So y- you can't figure out why or don't want to th- accept why you don't want to believe that you are part of the problem. I understand that. I understand that. Absolutely. But... <laughs> <laughs> part of your job as a critic is to understand what you're doing you might not be but you can't believe on the whole that <laughs> that the argument he's making in this movie isn't pretty persuasive because there's <laughs> nothing all that unrealistic in it no and that's, <laughs> that's that comes into a that that's a criticism i've heard though a lot is the movie is, i i can't argue with someone if they say they didn't think it was funny right like that's right, subjective it's funny, it, it's funny right but it, a lot of the arguments I hear come down to, well, it just sounds like he's commenting on exactly what's happening. He's not going far enough. And I'm like, but I don't know if that's his fault or the fault that we've reached a point in reality where it is just a step away from satire. Like it, it it's, you know, the situation is step different. away. Yeah. It's and there's a, a step away. There's a part of me that thinks if I saw don't look up, and the last two years hadn't happened. And all I, the only context I had with that was, oh, it's about climate change. You know, I'd be like, okay, maybe it's a little much. But the last two years, like, I, re- I feel like it reads almost better having gone through the last two years of science denying and, you know, finding other things to distract us from the hellscape going on outside our door. Like, it, it is. It, it, we've, it's just reached a point where the reality and the comedy are kind of in a competition to see what can go further. And uh, so I, I don't quite buy that, that it needs to go harder or it's not going hard enough. Um, I also read a lot that it seems to be, you know, he's preaching to the choir. He's, you know, he's not going to change anyone's minds. And I don't think that's the movie he made. This is I a, agree. This is a movie about someone who is looking around at the fact that we are screwing up every chance we get to make things better. And he's just screaming about it. And I don't know that he's even, I mean, yes, the movie screams on occasion, but I don't think he's even screaming about it. I think it's a cold clinical dissection. I don't think it's because so vice is a movie that screams vice is an angry, angry movie Mm. (laughs) with a target that he beats over and over and over. This is a huge shot. This is an ambitious attempt 
I mean, even if you don't like it, I don't understand how you don't give it credit for taking the giant yeah. swing that it does. I mean, I've gotten into a lot of arguments with people about uh, about this film. You know, this film so obviously wanted to be Doctor Strangelove and Network. And I say, well, okay, but Doctor Strangelove is doing one thing. It is satirizing the military mindset, which is very easy to do. Kubrick does it beautifully. I'm not, di- I'm not diminishing the film's power or effectiveness whatsoever. I'm simply saying I think that McKay is trying to do something far more difficult than that. And I am willing to, f- I, 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 I don't want to say I'm willing to forgive faults. I don't think there's all that many faults in the movie. I think it's really great. I think I, I, there might be some jokes that don't land as well as they should, but I think every point he's trying to make is absolutely on target. I, yeah, I don't, I don't understand the smug argument at all. It is a, it is a film that at its core isn't angry. It's sad. Yeah. Th- those final to, moments. As opposed to vice, you know, yeah. and as opposed to sort of the generally, you know, I would like to educate you and entertain you at the same time tone that the big short took. You know, the big short isn't the big short is just this kind of really happened. So you should probably maybe check out why this really happened mm-hmm. <laughs> and vice is so angry. And this is, this just sees the field. This is just calling it as it see, as they see it. And that's really effective. Yeah. I, and this from someone who, you know, as we've talked about, I don't, like everything Adam McKay's done, but I sure love these last three films a lot. <laughs> yeah, I, I really liked this one. It, it It's funny, and yet it also made me very sad for like an entire day. And, uh, yeah. The, the final moments, not counting the end credits, are really stark, like really beautiful and sad at the same time. Um, and it's it's hard to land that in a movie that also has you know, a running subplot about a general charging for snacks, even though he doesn't need it. And <laughs> it's a great bit. It's a great it really runner. is. Uh, it's a fantastic runner. So yeah, I'd be curious, uh, listeners, if, you, if you've if seen Don't Look Up, what you thought about it, go ahead and uh, tweet us back or send us an email. I'd, I'd like to hear your thoughts. Although I realize that's also been a movie that has been argued to death on Twitter. And now I'm kind of scared that I said that, but uh, we will see. Let him. So we are going to move from the recent very funny satire of Adam McKay to something totally different in tone. We're going, we're going back a half century. Half century in a much different tone. Um, but capitalism still in its sights. Um, we're, we're, we're continuing our Robert Altman series. Uh, you might remember last month we talked about MASH. And uh, we are talking now about, this is Robert Altman's third film, right? From, starting from MASH, yes. Okay, okay. <laughs> Let's not was, get hung up on technicalities. All right, sure. There, there was Brewster McCloud, which we still got to figure out a way to uh, to which get me to see that. Very hard to see, and yet it's sitting on my DVR ready for you to come over whenever. It is, we will do it that. Is, it is small and weird and worth seeing, but uh, I'm, it's, it is not major Altman by any means. Okay, maybe we'll get through the major Altmans first, and then we'll do a uh, little fun fun thing like a bunch of his little things all right that's good but this is this is his third film this is um sort of a western Uh, it's a western that doesn't feel like a western but that you you know in another person's hands this plot would be a west it's a revisionist western yes in the classic sense of the word yes and perry why don't you tell the good folks what this one's about so McCabe and Mrs. Miller stars Warren Beatty as McCabe, a guy who uh, rides into, it's not even a town yet. It's just so some buildings and a bunch of guys working the mines uh, called Presbyterian Church. And it's uh, located somewhere in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, and that's all we know, pretty much. And he rides into town. He sets up a gambling game. And within, uh, a, a, in short order, he's, he's an entrepreneur. And so he's worked up a bunch of businesses and pretty soon the businesses he's bringing in is, is helping the town start to boom. Uh, and from that leads to uh, the trafficking of women into town, uh, which leads to him meeting the acquaintance of Mrs. Miller, a, a, a very smart, very savvy uh, madam who understands how to run a, a brothel. And they, it, and it is about, it's about the town. I want to be real clear. This isn't the film that's about plot. 
this is, I mean, there's a plot. Most definitely there's a plot and most definitely there's a story, but we're not concerned about how we're getting from A to B to C. Like MASH, you're watching a bunch of people. You're watching mm-hmm. a community. You're watching a civilization that you slowly discover its rules and you discover its people without being told what they are. You're just watching people behave. Uh, and it's, uh, and it is just, I, I, every adjective sounds just ridiculously over the top. I will call it miraculously photographed by oh, Philip yeah. Sigmund. It's one of the most beautiful movies. And and a movie, uh, it's so hard to think of a movie that uses so many zooms as being beautiful, but it is. <laughs> they made or, a zoom of beautiful. Or, or I, I was thinking about that. It, it is gorgeous cinematography that at the same time, I would never want to go there because. Oh, yeah. It, oh, yeah, definitely. Oh, definitely. It is, it is muddy and you feel like the mud, like sucking your feet down. And everybody the, smells in this movie. Everyone you know every, everybody smells in this movie. Yep. Yes. And it, it just it feels cold, like when it when it's winter. Those winter scenes, especially at the end, oh, yeah. when everything in the so snow, good. it is such a cold looking movie. Yes. Um, yeah, I. It, it's funny that you started off by saying it's about the town and it's not really plot driven. I I have to admit, the first ten minutes of this movie, I was kind of like, uh oh, what am I in for? Because yeah, I can't understand. Like I I don't. And that's not even that nothing happens. It's like. I don't understand what people are saying because, you know, it is that it's that crosstalk. And I'm like, am I supposed to understand what all these people are talking about and what conversations are going on? And then you just kind of get immersed in it. And, you know, that first sequence at the bar is it really just that that rhythm kind of overtakes you. And you're you're kind of sitting in this bar watching him, you know, kind of start to ingratiate himself to the town people and yeah and, and watch you know them kind of wonder who he is and he's kind of figuring out the proprietor of the saloon and being like you know kind of quietly trying to figure out is is this guy going to be a business threat or something like that and then yeah it, it, a story does come you know into focus in the end by the end it, probably about halfway through when uh and we'll just be all over with the story but uh it, you know it, about the halfway point when he thinks he has the mining people figured out and he turns down the money. Yes. And you just, you understand he has just basically killed himself with that. <laughs> it, it's such a, uh, like that was the moment I was like, I don't, I don't know where this goes after this, but I know it doesn't go well for him. <laughs> and, and depending on how you, want to define well that's that can be true or that can be that you can argue that that is a the most successful possible ending <laughs> for what he intended to do not personally but you know that that town is there <laughs> and it yeah. is it is there on its own terms and that's kind of interesting like as all of this is really everything about this film is kind of interesting and i mean that in the most inquisitive like exciting way possible it is it just kind of like overtakes you after a bit and you just like it's very weird i I was thinking about this to see a movie where you can't see the structure right like you go into most movies today even even really good ones you can kind of see the plot structure when you're in there you know when you've hit a certain turning point Mm -hmm. or you know where it's heading at the end and this, like you said, it just unfolds very naturally. It's almost like it's a, it, they're making it up as they go along. It almost feels like, like it's developing in front of you. But also, and I think I talked about this a little bit with the James Bond movie and um, I think Dune. Just I miss it when people would make entire towns for a movie. Like, <laughs> like it, just, it, it gains so much from just, I, I know Altman and them, they, they built that entire town. They slept in those buildings when they were, when they were setting everything up. And uh, it just gains a lot from that sense of community as you see it take shape, yeah. like, like right in front of you and go from, you know, like the little crappy bar to the, uh, the bigger, you know, saloon and it, it, really fascinating to watch. It is, and it is a film that, for all we're talking, and, and again, I want to be clear: there's a plot. Like it's mm-hmm. not, a, it's not a series of sketches. 
it's it, there's a story there's a there's an absolute three act structured story going on throughout this thing yeah it's just but you it, don't... it is like you were saying it's a film that that envelops you you're just in it mm-hmm. <laughs> for a while and even for all of that it's and again seeing it and it's it's a it is if, if, if you you know put me under sodium pentahol i will tell you this is one of the two best altman films and i and it might be the best one uh it doesn't feel like two hours like it just no. it, it floats by in an opium dream haze <laughs> <laughs> it, it's really it's really fantastic what this film pulls off both yeah. just in your experience of it how it tells its story how interesting everything in it is from warren Beatty's performance to julie christie's accent to the fantastic Leonard Cohen songs, which by all accounts you should grow tired of, and you do not. Yeah. <laughs> you know, every time they come back, I'm like, oh, this one, yeah, that's really good. <laughs> and, and, well, they just have the right sound. They they sound yeah. tired. He he sound he you know and that's Leonard Cohen. He sounds tired. And yes. That is how everyone kind of looks in this half the time. Is very tired. Um, I just I love little details. I love the guy in the saloon at the beginning who's very worried about whether he should cut his, you know, his beard off oh, uh, yes. and how that's going to look. Um, I, I, I love stuff like that. Um, I love that Warren Beatty's McCabe is a dreamer, but not really doesn't really come off that bright at what he really needs to do. Um, yeah. You know, that's and that's where Mrs. Miller kind of she kind of sees that and exploits that because she is the businesswoman he needs to be successful. Yeah. And, and it's, it's fascinating to watch that relationship, which is kind of a romance, but there's also a consumerist thing Not to really. that as well. Yeah. But kinda, For kinda. one of them, especially. Oh, very much so. Yeah. He's got, he's got poetry in him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And, and it's, you know, and the film doesn't spill any of this out either. Like it's there but it's not talking down to you, yeah. right? Or it doesn't make it just about that because then there's also this whole thread of capitalism and going up against the man and, you know, trying to take on the bigger people and that's going to be a losing battle for you. The, the older and older I get, and boy, am I getting older, the, I, I realize that I think the films I'm most drawn to, and I'll, I'll go back and even just say the stories I'm most drawn to, Right are are the ones that provide no backstory <laughs> mm-hmm. it's, you know, it's, it's the reason I, I got into a conversation with a friend of mine today about taxi driver a thing that happens fairly often but you know that is the great thing to be about taxi drivers you don't you there's no flashback you don't learn anything about where travis came from after that opening job interview where he you find out he's a vietnam vet you don't mm-hmm. know anything you know we've talked about take this waltz you don't know anything about her. You just see where she is now and watch her go through this. I have no idea what her family life, what she grew up with. You know, there's no explanation for how she is. We just see what she is. And that's, that grows more and more powerful to me. And I'm just realizing now, honestly, didn't prepare this. You know, this might be my most sensible argument to why I am so turned off to, you know, all of the Marvel films at this point. It's like, no, I don't want to have to have seen 47 <laughs> other movies. Sure. Just show me. Just sh- show me what they're doing. Don't, I, don't I, I, I shouldn't have to know all that for you to tell me a story that moves me and affects me and gives me characters that I'm interested in. And that's, that's, that is, then this is one of the films that does that. You have no backstory. Yeah. You do not understand. You're, not, you're never told anything. <laughs> There's no big discovery that explains it all. It just is. And that's well, beautiful. And there's so much uh, going back to that too. Like there's this idea that information giving you more information about a character creates a character. It seems to be the, the idea, right. right? So, you know, this, you know how this syncs up with this and they had this and their parents were this, but it's really, it's, it's action reveals the character and you understand, you, you know, you don't know where McCabe came from, although there are, you know, they, they definitely, wonder about that and they have their hints and their ideas to where he came from and what he's been up to and sure it doesn't really tell you whether or not that's true you don't know a ton about mrs miller but you know these characters by the end you know what they're hoping for what their flaws are Uh, you know everything you need to know to get through those 
two hours and it, it feels very rich. Um, yeah, it, it really is fascinating. Like I, I love the fact that like McCabe just from the start, he, he, he holds himself differently than the people and say he dresses in that wonderful fur For yes. uh, and, yeah, and the bowler was. hat and everything. He looks out of place, but he looks like the guy who, you know, he's going to come in and he's going to make some money. He's got some ideas, but then you also, he doesn't quite know how to do that. He hasn't thought it through. He has the idea. He has the dream, but he doesn't, yep. he, he's not always the brightest person in the room, but he often thinks he is. Because then he can turn down the money and and he is the most charismatic. Yes, that that, that is worth that is worth noting. Uh, there's no rival for him in this town of, of of for leadership. Yeah. Gosh, I don't know. I don't know where else to go because there is so much going on in this. Yeah, it's it's a you know we can talk about it's a it's a, it is a film that does talk about capitalism and it does talk about. Uh, it, it does talk about religion in, you know, in its, yeah. in, it, and it talks about, it, you know, it, that manages to be both, it, it doesn't take a stand. It's talking about it. It doesn't have a strong point of view. The film isn't anti-religious by any means. It also is by no means sacred. It, is, mm-hmm. you know, it doesn't, it's, the, uh, you know, there's there, there's that wonderful sequence at the end where it's the, it's the the town has built this church throughout the movie, the Presbyterian church that the that no one goes to, that no one goes to, yeah. except you know at the end they're all trying to save it. Yep, mm-hmm. and it's on fire. It means something that it gives them a sense of 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 place. It means, and I do love the I love the sequence. You know, as this this final gunfight, we get a final gunfight. It's a western. Oh yeah, <laughs> we get a really good gunfight. Truth be told. Uh, you know, with with absolute echoes of High Noon, that you know when when McCabe comes down and the he's been he's been he's climbed up into the church to get the lay of the land and see where the baddies are. When he comes back down, you know the minister has his gun and won't give it to him, <laughs> and that's fantastic. <laughs> you know, that's that's there's all kinds of ways to read that, mm-hmm. and then they're all valid, and they're all well. I think I've used the word too much already. Interesting. Yeah, it it really is a movie that if you laid out what happens and you gave it to another director, this could be a traditional Western, right? Absolutely. The guy comes in, he's going to get his town going. The uh, the mining company tries to buy him out. He's not going to have it. He, you know, is on the run from the mining company. There is a traditional story there. But there's just so much character to it that makes it so much more interesting than that. Like, I'm not. I am not a huge Western person. Like that is a genre that for whatever reason, there are some I really like, um, but it's not what I gravitate toward. It's not mm-hmm. my thing. Um, but I like it when there's a little more coloring to it. And this movie brings that. It, it feels like it's actually about something or it has something to say. And I thought it was interesting that really McCabe and the mining company, they, they have the same ideas. He wants to make money. They want to make money. But in the end, only one person can be the richest person in town. And they have, you know, they're not going to play fair. They're not mm-hmm. going to take no. Um, and so he goes to, you know, the great William Devane uh, <laughs> for help. And, and I love that scene where he goes to the lawyer for help. And he learns, no, he's just another cog. He's going to be just a... He's, you know, he, he they want to make him a cause, take down. The, he just doesn't want to die. <laughs> yep. And that's the moment you just realize, oh, yeah, he's not getting out of this. He's in way over his head mm-hmm. all the way around right from the beginning. He's in over his head with Mrs. Miller. He's in over his head with the mining guys. He's he's just in over his head. Yeah. Um, I, I love his relationship with her. I, I, I love the scene where he, it, it does seem like a very romantic and tender scene. And then she reminds him he hasn't paid the money. Yes. And you can, you can just, you feel his deflation almost when that happens. Yeah. Like, you know, he thought this was something special to her. Everything is business. Yes. And man, it's good. And I was reading a little bit more. Um, I, I love that all the articles from the dissolve are still up online because they did a series of uh, entries on this movie as well. 
And they even brought up something I hadn't caught, which is the dirty joke wound through the movie uh, with with uh, is it David Carradine? Or yes. Keith? Okay. With, with his character being Not a little Keith, Keith, Keith Carradine. Keith. Okay. With his character being a little small, and Shelley Duvall's character has that similar arc, and at the end, she's very happy by him. Yes. And it, this is a really good movie. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's a fantastic movie. It is, and it is a true. It, you know, they don't make. It's a revisionist western. Mm-hmm. That's a very specific thing, and you know, it was pretty much. You know, Sam Peck and Paul made a career out of them, <laughs> and uh, and this is very much a Peck and Paul film. You know, not stylistically, but in lots of ways, this this could have been a Peck and Paul film. It would it would look like you're saying it would have looked a lot different. It, it would it would have sounded different for sure. Oh, yeah. But it, it it's going to be real familiar to anybody who likes those movies. You know, if you if you are a fan of the Wild Bunch give this a shot. You know, you'll find out why you like the wild bunch. Is it that you just really love the stylized violence or do you love what it's really about? <laughs> These are, and that's, that was what was great about this period of American film. Yeah. I I've loved going back to these seventies movies. Um, I, it's not something I, obviously I, I came along after the seventies, so it's not a period where I spent a ton of time, but I find like these movies just stick to the ribs in the way that, I don't think much does from the last few decades. Like there are films that do, but it feels like everyone we visited, I keep thinking, Oh, this is going to be the one I don't like. And it hasn't happened yet, (laughs) which, which is really interesting. Well, we will see what happens then with our next one, which is going to be, you know, Altman, I said, spent the first cents print spent 70 to 75, making eight films that were basically all more or less deconstructions of classic American genres. And of course we, we did his service comedy with MASH. This was his Western. And next up, we're going to do the long goodbye, which is his private eye film. And it okay. is, uh, it is, I, I don't want to say much other than to say that I think Elliot Gould gives one of the all time great performances in any movie in this movie. I love what Elliot Gould does throughout the long goodbye. You might not agree <laughs> and I'm eager to talk about it with you. I'm eager. Oh, I'm excited. I'm excited. Uh, but that's that's the one we need to do to do next. And it's a- it's a it's a uh, it is a wonderful compliment to McCabe because it is it is even more plotty. I mean, it, it is based on a Raymond Chandler novel, and it is it is. <laughs> I don't saying it's true to Chandler is going to be very misleading. Uh, but it is true in wanting to tell that story. It is, you know, it the, the long goodbye is the beginning of the tradition that ends with Lebowski. You okay. Know, it, is a, it is the twist on the classic L.A. private eye story. Uh, the modernist twist on it, the absurdist twist on it. Uh, and it's, it is, it is a very different experience than McCabe. And yet you'll be able to tell right away, oh, it's definitely still Altman. Still (laughs) Altman. Well, if it sounds anything like this. uh... (laughs) It's a little different in that this real, you know, the longer by has a lead. It has a guy you want following as opposed to these these other much more ensemble oriented things that we've watched at this point. Not that McCabe and Mrs. Miller really even is either. I don't think there's a scene McCabe isn't in. You know, <laughs> but it still feels like you know the whole town, <laughs> which is really yeah. impressive. Well, and there is a scene, at least one, that neither him or Julie Christie are in. It's the scene where yes. um I can think of shot down. Well, and then there's there's also we do have a scene of plot mechanics without them, where we 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 spend a we spend a meal with the mining uh the mining yes. guys. Yes. God, that's a good movie. That I I really like McCabe's that. McCabe's fantastic. I, McCabe is just a, it is uh, going back again. This was one of the best times I've ever had with it. I, I guess it had been I I watched it when Criterion released the Blu-ray a few years ago, and I don't think I've watched it since then. Uh, and oh, <laughs> it's, it's it's so good. Uh, I we will talk about what I my, what the other the other nominee for me for the Altman's greatest achievement. We're going to see it, uh, pretty quickly. It's not the long goodbye, but I love the long goodbye a lot. Uh, and uh, it's Na- I'll just say it's Nashville. And I've always said that Nashville is the movie that has that improves for me 
that I think is more magnificent every time I see it more than any other movie. It's greatness just gets more exponentially great to me every time I see it. Not that it's in my top 10 of all time. I, you know, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying, wow, every time I see it, I see something new. I see something that unfolds differently than I felt about it before. Uh, and boy, McCabe was just, and I know how great it is. <laughs> and even then I was like, wow, I hadn't really thought about how great this film is in a long, how great this film is in a long time. It was, I was really happy to go back to it. I didn't know I was going to love it again that much. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it, it's the thing I also find about these seventies movies is it, it almost feels like when you talk about how great a movie is, some people tense up because it, you, you get the idea you're going to be eating your vegetables. And I never feel like that with these, like, <laughs> because they are also, they're entertaining and interesting in their own way. The story grips you. Yeah. It's just that it feels richer because there's 20 other things going on, or it's just done extremely well. And we don't get a ton of that these days. No. Um, so yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm really grateful to have seen this. Um, Good. Do you have anything else to say on McCabe and Mrs. Miller? I know we've been all over the place. I will tell you that my, my, uh, my, my cheap, joke for it for the last few years has been it is by far my favorite song of ice and fire i i know that's a game of thrones joke it and, is, uh, it is. I, i've seen like three episodes of game of thrones so. i don't care i haven't seen any <laughs> but i'm sure this is miller still my favorite oh, okay. song of ice and fire oh, okay okay <laughs> oh god bless it now i get it <laughs> <laughs> oh well with that perry where can people find you online you can hear me every Friday morning on WLBY on the Lucy and Lance show. You can hear me on occasion at the Cathode Ray Mission podcast. Uh, and you can find me on Facebook at Perry, or sorry, Facebook at, by my name. You can find me on Twitter at Perry Loves Film. I tweet there very irregularly, but it's award season. So who knows? All right. Where can we find you, Chris? You can find me on Twitter at Mere Christianity, and I tweet there a lot. Um, you can find me on Facebook at Christicisms. Um, but the best thing to do is subscribe to my newsletter, Christicisms. It's on Substack. The link is in the show notes. It's free. I, I put writing out about three times a week. Um, a lot of different stuff. Uh, new movies, write about old movies. Uh, every Friday, I do something called Franchise Fridays, where I go film by film through a different franchise. And right now, I, as I said, I'm going through the Before Trilogy and... Uh, you know, it, it's been really fun to go back and revisit those and just realize I love those movies a ton and so much more fun than uh, going through all the Batman movies, uh, <laughs> which, is, which is coming in March and uh, or no, February. And um, yeah, that, that hasn't been fun. But is it true? It's going to be one of the it's going to be the longest Batman movie. I hear three hours. Everything is three <laughs> hours now. Like like the Avengers did that. And. You know, once they hit the three hour moment, now that's like, well, if you want your superhero movie to be important, it's three hours. And I guarantee an hour of it is just slow motion pearls dropping to the ground. <laughs> so I yeah. probably probably I, I should note my Batman series is only going to be the first four Batman movies. The uh, first wave of Batman movies. Gotcha. Um, we'll save the Nolan ones for later. And, uh, <laughs> Smart. And the Snyder ones for never. Never. <laughs> we'll be back in a few weeks. Um, I don't know if we're going to get into Altman on that one. We have a few different things in the works, uh, but we will be back in a few weeks and it's going to be fun. <laughs>